Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Simon, and I'm the Executive Director of Northwestern Hillel. It's my honor to welcome you to this special speaker event featuring Jody Cantor and Megan Tui in conversation with Professor Patty Wolter. I'm particularly delighted because, as some of you know, this program was rescheduled from last April. But I'm even more delighted because that was the second time we had to postpone it, as the original event was first scheduled for April 2020. <laughs> we all know how that turned out. In any case, we're finally here, and the content of Jody and Megan's reporting is, if anything, as relevant and important as ever. In a moment, we'll introduce Jody and Megan and Patty, but I first want to share a few words about Hillel and to extend some thank yous. Hillel is a center of Jewish life at this great university and the catalyst for Jewish expression of all kinds. At Hillel, we work to inspire Jewish students to make a meaningful and enduring commitment to Jewish life, and we enrich the lives of students so that they may enrich the campus, the Jewish community, and the world. A challenge we embrace is helping students to, co to connect the relevance of their particular Jewish identity to their complex overall identities and their role as citizens in an inter interconnected, globalized world. One way we do this is through campus-wide initiatives that foster diversity, inclusion, and civic engagement. Today's event is an example of this, and we're so grateful to our partner institutions and co-sponsors, the Office of the President, the Contemporary Thought Speaker Series, and of course, our hosts in this great space, Medill. Thank you to my friend, the wonderful Dean Charles Whitaker, and his team for helping to make this happen. I also want to express, like, yes, thank you. I also want to express appreciation to the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago for its tremendous partnership and support. Kudos to the staff and students who helped to make not just this event possible, but who create all of Hillel's great programming and initiatives. I want to give specific thanks and a shout out to Hillel's development and communications manager, Rachel Moroff, for her, oh, she's right back there, for her incredible effort in making today's event a reality. <clears throat> Special thanks to the Hillel Board of Directors and extra special appreciation to the Jordan and Jean Nirenberg Family Foundation for their visionary support of this event. Lastly, thanks to you, students, faculty, community members, and friends for joining us. When Jordan and Jean Nirenberg first floated the idea for a speaker event with me, they hoped we would bring speakers who would inspire students to address, excuse me, to inspire students to address complex questions about the world through rigorous and clear-eyed inquiry. We are tremendously fortunate to have Jody and Megan and Patty speaking tonight about key issues of the day. For me, the connection between Medill and Hillel runs deeper than co-sponsoring great events like this. At Hillel, we have pens that say, write your story, because we encourage students to author their own stories and to see their personal story as part of the multi-layered, centuries-old narrative and narratives that comprise the story of the Jewish people. This, it seems to me, is also the work of great journalists telling stories that help us make sense of our world and that inspire us to meaningful action. The most important nexus of Hillel and Medill is students who are deeply connected to both. I am delighted to introduce one such student, Margot Amuyal. Margot is a second year student at Northwestern pursuing a double major in journalism and economics. She's passionate about the future of journalism, multimedia storytelling and business reporting, and she's driven to find new creative and compelling ways to tell stories and she's a wonderful part of the Northwestern Jewish community. And tonight, she's here to introduce our speakers and, moder and moderator. So Margo, take it away. I am thrilled to introduce Megan Chewy and Jody Cantor today. Jody Cantor is a prize-winning investigative reporter for the New York Times and a best-selling author whose work has revealed hidden truths about power, gender, technology, politics, and culture. She has reported on numerous critical stories that have ushered in widespread social change. For example, her inquiry into Starbucks usage of automated scheduling systems revealed widespread detriment to workers. Cantor's journalism spurred company-wide changes and helped launch a national fair scheduling movement. She also reported on, along with David Streitfeld, punishment practices at Amazon's corporate headquarters. Following this investigation, Amazon changed its human resources policies by introducing paternity leave and eliminating its employee ranking system. The list goes on. 
Cantor detailed Harvard Business School's attempt to change its climate for women, which provoked a national conversation about women in business schools. Her reporting, her, excuse me, <laughs> her report on working mothers and breastfeeding inspired two readers to create the first free lactation suites for nursing mothers. The innovation is now available in hundreds of airports and stadiums. Megan Tuohy is also a prize-winning investigative reporter for the New York Times and a best-selling author who has focused much of her work on the treatment of women and children. Tuohy was one of the first journalists to reveal the problem of untested rape kits. She exposed a black market for adopted children in a series of stories that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. She also has reported on Donald J. Trump, uncovering allegations of sexual misconduct and helping to illuminate illegal efforts to silence women who claimed they had affairs with him. In 2021, she produced an impactful, an impactful investigation that revealed a suicide website run by two shadowy figures that was linked to the deaths of many young people. Tui's work has been featured on the New York Times podcast, The Daily. Her interview of Donna Rotino, one of Weinberg's uh, one of Weinstein's criminal attorneys is among the podcast's most downloaded episodes. And fun fact, Tui's hometown is Evanston, Illinois. In October of 2017, Cantor and Tui together broke the story of Harvey Weinstein's decades of sexual abuse allegations. Their work helped ignite the hashtag MeToo movement, shift attitudes, spur new laws, policies, and standards of accountability around the globe. I am sure most people here are familiar with the widespread global impacts this movement has had. Together with a team of colleagues who exposed harassment across industries, they were, they were awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, journalism's highest award. Cantor and Tui also received numerous other prestigious awards for their reporting, including a George Polk Award and the McGill, McGill, uh, the McGill Medal for Journalistic Courage. Cantor and Tui built on their investigation on Weinstein and sexual harassment in a New York Times best-selling book entitled She Said, Breaking the Sexual Harassment Story That Helped Ignite a Movement, published in 2019 by Penguin Press. Copies of the book are available immediately following this event. She Said has been adapted into a film by Plan B Entertainment that will be released this fall. Cantor and Tui also adapted She Said into a book called Chasing the Truth, a young journalist's guide to investigative reporting. The guide pulls young readers into Harvey Weinstein's investigation and shares the duo's investigative process and journalistic practices. Tui and Cantor are not only inspirational for aspiring journalists such as myself, but for all those who want to spark change and make a difference in the world. Through their relentless commitment to the truth and holding power yeah. accountable, they have exemplified the values of repairing the world. We are, we are excited to welcome Megan back to her hometown of Evanston, and we are so grateful to Jody and Megan for joining us today. Please join me in welcoming Jody, Megan, and Patty. And I would also like to briefly introduce Patty as well. Uh, our event will be moderated by another incredible journalist, Medill Professor Patty Wolter. Wolter joined the Medill faculty in spring of 2002. She was named the Helen Gurley Brown Magazine Professor in 2018 and Charles Deering McCormick Distinguished Clinical Professor in 2020. She is a regular judge for the National Magazine Awards and is a member of the Knight Foundation's Science Journalism Project. Walter has received numerous teaching awards from Northwestern's Associated Student Government and was Medill's Undergraduate Professor of the Year in 2017. Obviously, these are very accomplished women, so we are so excited to welcome them again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and so exciting to see a good full room. I'm supposed to say this at the end, but I'm afraid I'm going to forget. So next Wednesday, there's going to be a QR code posted for free tickets to a screening of the movie. Uh, I think it's here on campus. Um, I think it's actually at the oh, Wilmette. it's back at the Wilmette. Okay, at the Wilmette Theater, which is just a little bit north of the football stadium, folks. Um, so look for that QR code so you too can see the movie. And I want to make sure you all seize that opportunity because it's a, um, I got to see it last night and it's a fun adventure. But let me start off some really good questions about what it's like to be an investigative reporter. Jody, recently in an article, you described your early days of reporting the Weinstein story as 
holding terrible secrets and no path to make it public. Um, I also think it's a line in the movie or there's a similar line in the movie, but it really reminded me of some conversations I've had with students recently about covering tough events and knowing things that for often very good ethical reasons you can't go public with. And and that means you almost have no way to process difficult information. So I'm wondering, what's your advice for how to personally carry and process difficult, sad knowledge that's not public or shareable? Well, first of all, we just wanted to um, thank everybody for bringing us here. It required three years of persistence, rescheduling, emails, COVID tests, so you guys know the rest of the story, um, to come here, but we are delighted and thrilled. It, it all appears to have worked out. We got here on like the most beautiful um, fall week in Chicago. Um, there was a little screening of the She Said film uh, last night for the Tui family, and, um, and so thank you. Thank you to Hillel and Medill, and um, thank you, thank you for your, for your patience. Um, so to the, to your question, there are kind of two stages of an investigation. Often, unless you start with sort of a perfect tip, at the beginning of an investigation, you don't really know what the truth is. And so you have the anxiety of not knowing, and that can not, you know, it can feel very unresolved. You know, are you gonna find out? What are you gonna find out? Was there actually any wrongdoing? Is there really a story there? Then when you begin to learn things, the anxiety shifts to the second stage, which is kind of a different form, which is I have this information, but can I put it in the paper? Can I prove it? And that was a, that was a long and difficult moment in the Weinstein investigation. It's the moment that brought us together and it lasted for most of the investigation and it mounted as we learned more and more of these women's stories. And there was a kind of devastating moment in life when we were pretty far along and our beloved editor, Rebecca Corbett, took us out for a drink one evening and she said, to us, so what do you have, what do you know? And she already knew the answer, but she was making us kind of recite it for effect. And we took her through the like pretty substantial list of, of alleged violations that we knew about. But then she said, how many of these stories are on the record? And we said, none. And she looked at us and she said, you do not have a publishable story. And that was, that was devastating because knowing that this stuff happened is bad enough, but you know, the investigation for the most part was very galvanizing because the idea was to bring this to light and put the puzzle pieces together and do something productive with all of this information. And we had very carefully been building the faith and trust of these sources. It was, you know, when people ask us what was scary about the Weinstein investigation, for us it wasn't Weinstein himself, it was this prospect of failure. So as far as your excellent question of what you do with that, I mean, it's what motivates you. It's the reason to keep going. It's, 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 Man, I mean, there are all sorts of times when you let an investigation drop, but not when you think you know the truth and you just haven't figured out how to prove it. Megan, so you can answer the same question, but related is, as you just heard, everybody, she's covered suicide, black markets for adoption, sexual harassment. And I thought, ooh, that's an intense day job. How do you not go home despondent? Mm. Well, there are certainly days when I do go home despondent. I'll be very honest with you about that. And listen, there's no question that, I mean, Jody and I feel so lucky to be able to do this work. I mean, all of us, you know, anybody who has a heart can look around at what goes on in the world and be upset by some of the things that they witness. Um, injustice, wrongdoing, abuses of power. And we feel so lucky that it's our job to go out and uncover that stuff and bring it to light with the hopes 
that it can actually make a difference, that we can help turn our um, sort of our, our kind of personal outrage at some of the things that we witness into productive stories that can actually change those things. And so even when we are working on admittedly very difficult subjects and immersing ourselves in the stories of sexual assault victims, um, families who have lost children to suicide, people who have suffered um, other types of outrageous uh, abuses in the workplace, there's, <laughs> there's no question that we Listen, we don't we don't you know stop reporting at six o'clock at night and just leave that stuff um, at our desks. We're really carrying it with us at all times. And Jody and I have talked about this. There's always it's certainly a point for me in a big story where I start dreaming about it, and I can't. I, I mean, it's like I can't. It, it's it's like a loop in my head. And um, but I think that there are. So I think that. As Jody said, one of the things that's like, one of the ways that you cope with those feelings is you channel it back into the work. And you acknowledge, listen, I'm not gonna actually make much of a difference if I just sit here on the couch at night and feel sorry for everybody that I'm encountering and maybe feel sorry for myself that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm completely immersed in this. Um, but I do think that, and I think more importantly, the more that I have reported into mental health issues over the last couple of years, especially in the pandemic, the more I have come to recognize that the work that, how many people um, are, are, are in pain and are suffering from depression and anxiety, that's students here on campus, that's reporters doing our jobs. And so I have also become more open about the fact that those things, I do have moments where I feel despondent. I do have moments where I think maybe the story is not gonna have an impact and I'm just collecting all of this pain. <laughs> it's not gonna be of any service. And so I've tried, listen, is there, I don't have the solution to all of that, but for me being able to articulate that, to tell whether I'm working with a partner on a story or my editors, like I, when I was working on the story about suicide, there was a moment where every single person involved in that story, from editors to photographers to graphic designers, cried. And which, you know, as reporters, you're supposed to be tough and not show that. But I thought that that was actually really valuable. And there were moments where we had to say, listen, I need, a, I need an afternoon off. I have to go get some natural light. I have to get some fresh air. So I think to acknowledge some of the emotional difficulty can be a good and a valuable thing. So I do that now with colleagues, and I do that with my boss, even though that can be uncomfortable. And I also do that you know, with my friends and my family. Um, I, I really acknowledge, I'll say to my husband, oh my goodness, this investigation is really, you know, is really ratcheting up, and I'm really feeling a lot of pressure, and I'm feeling a lot of anxiety. Bear with me. I'm going to do my best to handle it, but just be aware of it, because it's happening. <laughs> Similarly, um, I think a cultural criticism of journalism right now is that we're too extractive, right? We're trying to get people to tell the stories of some of the worst parts of their lives, and we get accused of chasing Pulitzers for it. I, I actually think the She Said book, you do a lovely job of demonstrating ways to take care of your sources. I want to be clear that I'm not lobbying that or leveling that criticism on you right now, but I'm curious about your strategies for caretaking sources and not doing extractive journalism. Um, I, heard an in I heard a story from colleagues recently about this that had a lot of impact on me as a journalist, and I got their permission to share it today. You know, anybody who worked on it will tell you that covering school shootings is really hard and covering what happened in Uvalde is just, it's beyond. I mean, it's beyond. It's the worst story that, you know, many of our colleagues have ever covered. And um, our correspondent, Rick Rojas, uh, had the very, very difficult job of covering that story with a photographer he's very close to, Edgar Sandoval. And Rick recently told me um, about being in the bedroom of one of the young victims. This was um, for a story about the lingering grief there. Um, the, the New York Times journalists were there after a lot of the national media um, had cleaned out and they wanted to grasp like the depth, 
you know, and the kind of lastingness of what happened and the community's challenges in dealing with it. Um, so they had formed this relationship with this family that lost a child and um, they, you know, they were there not only doing an interview, but they wanted to take photographs. So of course, Edgar, um, the photographer, asked permission, but then as the parents led him through the home, he kept asking permission before he clicked the camera every time. And Rick is telling a bunch of us in the New York Times newsroom back in New York this story, and he's describing Edgar asking, can I photograph this teddy bear? Family says yes. Can I photograph the bedspread? Family says yes. And I was so moved by this story because I thought about the gesture of respect of not only asking permission to photograph, but asking permission to take every photograph long past the point where formal permission is needed in the relationship. So even though I think your question about ex being overly extractive is a good one, what I would encourage you to do in your journalism is come up with the techniques to work through that and to pay people the respect that they deserve and you know, use your question as a tool, but don't let it inhibit you because I don't want you to go to not do a story or not become a journalist or be afraid to ask a tough personal question because you're worried that you're gonna be taking something from somebody in an unfair way. Because you know you have to play your position and your job in that moment is to be the journalist. It's their job, especially in that kind of tragic situation, to decide whether they wanna grant an interview and let the photographs be taken or not. And it's a gesture of respect to give them both that power to say no, but also the opportunity. And what Rick said is that, you know, the family not only thanked them for being so sensitive, but the family's feeling was, we want people to know. We want people to know, and we want our child to be remembered. And if that's their expressed wish, you, you go with it and you respect it. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for sharing that um, anecdote with us. That's uh, that's very powerful. I think um, we expect journalists who know about a lot of situations to be people that can then tell us how to think about them, and that's not really the job, is it? Um, so I'm guessing um, that a lot of people want you to tell them what to think about Harvey Weinstein and what's next and who's going to fall and who's who's going to uh, be forgiven. And I'm curious how you channel that as journalists. I would love to know sort of who you're investigating next, but also how you deal with that pressure now that you're kind of the experts. Mm -hmm. It, it's a really good question, and it is something that we have faced since we first broke the Weinstein story in 2017. And listen, Jody and I had been reporting on um, women's experiences, women in the workplace. I had done a lot of coverage, previous coverage of sex crimes here in Chicago. And um, so there was no question that we came into the Weinstein story caring a lot about women and caring a lot about women's experiences and wanting to do stories that gave, give voice to the to the to to women's experiences we have also at the same time been very clear that we are not activists and we are not advocates and perhaps more than any other story once the me too movement went viral and this became a global reckoning and we had a story and work that was connected to that and had helped fuel that more than ever before. I think that oft sometimes our public perceptions could somehow be obscured by the broader, um, extremely exciting movement that was happening. And so we would often get questions, you know, where, where should the Me Too movement go? What's the answer? How long should uh, the accused, uh, once they've been found guilty, uh, how long should it be before they can come back into society? 
all of these very questions about policy, about rules, about laws, and we have repeatedly, we've really made a point um, over these last five years of stressing that that is not our job. And we have a very specific job, we take it very seriously, and we actually, I mean, it's one of the reasons we wrote our book is that I think that, I mean, you guys who are studying journalism, you may have this experience in talking to your friends or your families that the general public has very little understanding <laughs> of what it is that we do as journalists in, gen in general. And especially now as the country has gotten so much more polarized and you've got kind of both sides of the divide pointing fingers and accusing the other side of fake news, there is, so, there is more confusion than ever before and misunderstanding. And so one of the reasons that we wrote this book is we wanted to basically pull the curtain back um, on investigative journalism and specifically the reporting that we did on this story and show people how, yes, we have convictions and we have beliefs, but when we do this work, we're checking those at the door and we're putting on that reporting hat and we are following you know, the rules of accuracy and fairness and integrity and due diligence and that that is in many ways what helped, what explained why this story I think had such a huge impact. And so while we're happy to engage in those conversations, we always make clear that, listen, you can't solve a problem that you can't see. And we think that our jobs as journalists is, is to help bring the truth to light. And even since we first broke the Weinstein story, we have continued to report on the twists and turns the, as the Me Too movement got more complicated and there were more questions about fairness. And um, we, I mean, our response was to keep reporting as opposed to going on TV and you know stating our opinions. Can you share some of your favorite places to keep reporting in this issue? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think I think what we would say is that one of the hardest things to balance about the last couple of years is that there's so much else to report on. Megan and I have had many conversations about, you know, to what extent do we want to continue to do me two stories in the future versus like frankly the necessity of moving on to all of these different areas because, listen, like the emotional attachment to this subject area is very, very real for both of us. Um, the knowledge is hard won. The trust that, you know, some women sources place in us is, is really, really sacred. Um, but, you know, the Weinstein story was an example of journalism stepping in where every other system had failed, right? I mean, HR, the law, boards of directors, et cetera, et cetera. We were like kind of the last resort form of accountability for Harvey Weinstein. When you look at the Me Too problems in the world, you could have the entire staff of the New York Times do Me Too stories every single day, we still wouldn't get to the bottom of the pile, right? I mean, this is like a universal problem all over the world. And Megan and I have a responsibility kind of in our job description to always be looking for the next problem and to be like actively and sometimes painfully engaged with the existential struggle of like, what do you focus on next? And so in some ways we have, we've had to, in different ways, force ourselves to leave like the kind of confirmed success of doing Me Too stories and push on into areas where the results are much less certain. Because, you know, I hope there are a whole bunch of people interested in investigative journalism here tonight. And one thing we will tell you is that, again, unless you have like the perfect golden tip, which in my experience is very rare, when you embark on an investigative project, you don't know what you're gonna find. You have to have the humility every single time to face the possibility of failure. But coming back to that place again and again of like, I just don't know that much, I just don't 
know where this is going to go. I mean, that's really the job. I agree. Humility is definitely one of the values that we try to impart in our students. I feel like we're talking about a lot of the really serious stuff, so I thought I'd ask a quick fun question about the movie. Um, it's a great, exciting movie, folks. I teared up with on-screen Jody last night when Ashley Judd finally agreed to be on the record. It's not a spoiler alert. You all know how the, how the book goes. I held my breath when they hit publish on the, the click of the button at the end. Um, so congratulations. But what is it like to see yourselves on screen and your lives revealed that way? Um, I, I think it's still something we're trying to wrap our heads around, that's for sure. Uh, when we were doing this, when we were working on this story, we certainly could never have predicted, A, that there would, you know, it would help fuel this global reckoning um, on sexual harassment and abuse, and certainly not that it would ever be made into a movie. And in fact, there was this moment as we were kind of hustling in those final days to get to the moment when we could publish, and Weinstein was coming at us with everything he had, like you know, sending legal threats to the New York Times lawyer. Um, we know that you know, calling, starting to call some of the people that we had spoken to to try to intimidate them barging into the New York Times uninvited with some of his lawyers by his side. It was like playing like whack-a-mole as we were trying to dot our I's and cross our T's and people were going on and off the record. I mean, it was extremely, felt like just a total high wire act at that point. And one of the things he did in that moment was to give an interview to one of, uh, to two of the kind of industry at the Hollywood publications. I think it was the Hollywood Reporter and Variety. And uh, I think Variety had gotten word that the New York Times of what the New York Times was up to, that we were reporting on, that we we're about to drop this big story on his treatment of women. And of course, there'd been rumors about this for decades, and nobody had ever actually delivered the story. So they do a story about the story <laughs> that it's coming out, and they go to Weinstein, and they, they ask him for comment. And he said, uh, you know, he, he certainly denied knowing anything about it. And uh, even as he was you know, sending us legal threats in that probably that very minute. Um, and he, to, he, to, to, to really sort of underscore his denial, he said, oh, it sounds, you know, but it sounds so good, it would actually make for a good movie. <laughs> and um, maybe he was right. Um, so, but this is just to say, when that happened to us, when that was the first time anybody had ever mentioned anything about a movie, Weinstein himself, not surprisingly, but Jody and I, in those moments, we were so consumed with wanting to make sure that we delivered the facts and we were carrying all of the responsibility for these sources, these incredibly brave sources. And so it was the furthest thing from our minds. So to five years later have the, a movie actually materialize, you know, it is not only a completely stunning and surreal experience, but it also is admittedly really exciting because of course the movie depicts us as in, in the jobs that we do, but I think more importantly, it depicts these incredibly brave sources. And you saw that last night. This is not, sometimes journalism movies just kind of um, skate over the, the sources and they, they don't really necessarily come to life. That's not the case with this movie. You can really see these, and they're not always the famous actresses. They're, they're, you know, women who are living by many measures of everyday lives, um, who played an extremely crucial role in this investigation, and you could argu argue played a really crucial role in helping to ignite this Me Too movement. And so to see that up on the screen, to see these, these women that we got to know through the course of our reporting, to, for the world to get to know them through this movie is, is, is thrilling for us. But they're all, we're also all getting to know you all. Like, okay, we, sure. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep pushing on this. Like, we see your apartments. We we get led into your private lives in this movie. And you just told us that you're pretty militant about maintaining your position as journalists. So, how are you feeling about that and anticipating this change? I mean, I think we feel proud of some of the qualities that those characters display. I mean, I think the thing I feel the best about is that, like, in terms of the depiction of us, is it 
it's so rare to see journalism depicted with this much sincerity. I mean, how many of us have read these cynical, manipulative journalist characters, female journalists sleeping with their sources? Like who, I mean, who in this room has not read the Harry Potter books? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, we've got, I think, two or three people. Rita Skeeter, the journalist character, is like one of the worst people alive. These are the books that we give children who like to read. This is what we tell them about journalism. And so I think the earnestness with which we're portrayed, the professionalism of the New York Times, that is is real. It's not that every moment is real. It's not that we're exactly the people who are depicted on screen. This is a movie version. It's a two-hour version of, you know, a six-month investigation. Certain things are changed or filigreed, you know, for dramatic effect. That's fine. It, it lives, I think, alongside the sort of real facts of the investigation as contained in this book in what we think and hope can be like a pretty healthy way. And then the bold provocative thing about it is that it returns the Weinstein story to Weinstein's medium and his native ground. And, and that, you know, I, I think the filmmakers made a, like a really interesting choice to do this. And we're just waiting to see how the world responds. Excellent. I know all of you have questions. I could ask a million more myself, but let's open it up to the audience. We've got some people running mics around. Raise your hands. So I'm a journalism student, but I'm also like a huge movie buff. So I'm really excited about this movie. Um, I guess I was kind of wondering, like, what was your involvement in like the production of this movie, were you reluctant to it at first, or were you really kind of excited to explore this? Because, like as you said, like the genius of the idea is that it's his medium, his like work that he's known for, and now they're making a movie about, you know, your journalism covering um, his uh, misconduct, <laughs> to put it lightly. I mean, well, that's a good question, and, and we were lucky because. You know, when when producer when producers started calling, you know, we had something to show them. I mean, we had actually um, written out many of the scenes of our investigation as they played out, and so I think that that was something that we felt extremely grateful for. That they weren't just kind of cold calling and coming in from scratch. They had an, a, a kind of a manual on how to start telling this story in the pages of our book. Um, that said, we did, you know, it didn't, it, we didn't just hand over the book and then like watch the movie last week for the first time. Um, we were really grateful that they were, um, they consulted with us the whole time. At first it was the producers who were interested in this. They came to New York, they came into the New York Times, they spent time with us. They really wanted to know what was, you know, how, how to kind of do this as accurately and with as much integrity as possible. There are a lot of producers out there that wouldn't have done that, and that was one of the reasons that we went with this particular, with with Plan B. Um, they had a track record of doing films that, um, whether real life or other sensitive stories, um, true to life or other sensitive stories, um, uh, with a lot of integrity, like 12 Years a Slave and Moonlight. And so we could see, we felt like we saw those values in our initial conversations and consultations. And you know, then it was, then we were meeting a director and then we were, well, sorry, then we were reading the screenwriter, meeting the screenwriter who also came to New York and spent time with us, not just at the New York Times, but came into our homes and had meals with us. Um, there was one morning where, you know, I made pancakes for the screenwriter with, you know, our young daughter and my husband, and she wanted to know questions, not just about the work, but about our lives. And as we had pointed out, we had been largely private. I mean, we go, we speak about our work in public, but we have never really revealed um, our home lives to the public. And this depicts us, in, in some, at least in, in, in my case, it depicts um, this 
postpartum depression I had after my daughter was born. Like I, I kind of was reporting on Trump up through him, his getting elected and I went off and had a baby and had some postpartum depression and then started the Weinstein investigation my first day back from maternity leave. So that's depicted in this film. And um, so we were to not only be kind of turning over this, this investigation, the story of our investigation, but some of the personal Lot, story, the stories of our personal lives to these folks was something that we were just grateful that they really took, seemed to take that very seriously. And it went all the way up through that, you know, we're depicted by Zoe Kazan and Carrie Mulligan. You know, they spent time with us first over Zooms and then um, over meals in Brooklyn. And so that was a very, especially for us as reporters, we're used to being the ones, you know, carefully questioning and observing and then figuring out how to take all that information and apply it into storytelling. And so to have that process turned on us, I think I can speak for both of us and say that that was very, very, a very strange role reversal and took some getting used to. And I don't think we're still, I still don't think we're, we've gotten used to it. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, this whole time, I can't help but think this draws immense parallels to Roger Ailes and his sexual assault, predominantly in the newsroom, in the broadcast newsroom. So I was wondering, did you ever have any encounter or intersection with people like Gretchen Carlson or Megyn Kelly as they were unearthing the sexual assault that was happening right beneath their noses? Well, there's a really powerful connection between the Weinstein story and Fox News, which is that right before we did the Weinstein story, like the thing that was in many ways the precipitating event for the Weinstein story is that our colleagues, Emily Steele and Mike Schmidt, were the ones who unearthed the sexual harassment allegations against Bill O'Reilly from Fox. And I mean, does everybody in the room know who Bill O'Reilly is? Yeah, okay. So because as as time, you know, I know that there's a tendency to feel like, oh, that was, you know, 125 sexual harassment stories ago. But it's still a very, very, very seminal one, not only because he was such a powerful Fox host, but because Emily and Mike really wrote the playbook for how you report on these settlements that keep women silent. And so once they did that story, O'Reilly was fired. And that was like an extraordinary event because there had not been a strong history of accountability on these issues. And that's when the editors came to me and some other reporters and said, they asked what now feels like a very quaint question. They said, are there other powerful men in American life who may have covered up allegations of wrongdoing um, against women? Um, and so, you know, cute, the, the editor said to me, like, okay, like, who should we report on? And I did a little bit of uh, calling around, and I came back, and I said, I think we should work on Harvey Weinstein. Hi. Yeah, again, thank you for coming. Um, my question is, like, regarding the sources, and as you guys were sharing, clearly, um, for a lot of this, these women, you like are asking them to risk uh, the loss of their careers and very, very serious stuff. And I'm guessing, like at first, a lot of people say no right up, right out of like being scared and everything. So my question is more like, how did you guys follow this process? Like, do you ask for them to then, I guess, connect to someone else? Do you come back? How do you even begin asking these questions, knowing that? you know, these women are like risking so much and yeah. And well, you know, that's actually how Jody and I first started working together because I was on maternity leave drowning in diapers um, and <laughs> uh, Jody was starting to dig into the rumors about this powerful producer and was starting to have conversations with uh, sort of very hushed conversations with uh, some actresses who had eerily similar accounts of showing up to hotel rooms for what were supposed to be business meetings that turned into something much more uh, intense and uh, wrong. <laughs> and so, but she was also quickly learning that nobody, that everybody was terrified to go on the record. And this was, these in some cases were, you know, powerful, like seemingly powerful, successful, famous women. 
And so the fact that these women were terrified to go on the record said something, right? I mean, if, if, if these women who can, we, we view as being some of the most um, like respected, revered figures who the public likes to listen to, you know, if they're scared to, to go on the record, what, you know, what does that mean more broadly? And so Jody and I didn't know each other very well, uh, and, uh, but she was aware that I had done reporting, not just on women who had made allegations, sexual misconduct allegations against Donald Trump in 2016, but I had also done a lot of sex crimes coverage here in Chicago, working for the Chicago Tribune, and had worked with women who went on the record. And so I was on maternity leave, and the phone calls, the phone rings, and you know, Jody's explaining to me what's happening in these initial conversations that she's having. And she said, you know, what case did you make to the women who went on the record on some of these previous stories that you've done? And I told her the truth, which is that, you know, the case that I had made time and again was, you know, I can't change what's happened to you in the past, but if you participate in the story, we might be able to help protect other women. You know, we might be able to make a difference moving forward. And uh, I think when you are trying to figure out what's going to be an incentive for somebody to risk the damage that they could experience to their reputations, to their careers, I think if they believe that they're doing that just for themselves, that's like a tough calculation to make, a co you know, like a tough cost-benefit analysis to make. But if they believe that they're participating in something that's going to help other people and other women and help prevent other people from experiencing what they went through, I think you can see how that can really um, help tip the calculation and can, and I don't know if that's, and I don't think that's just specific to women and I don't think that's just specific to this investigation. I think when it comes to, we are always faced with that in our work, people who are, have every reason to not speak out and to stay quiet and to shut the door and to hang up the phone. And we are trying to, as responsibly as possible, make the case that if you come in and participate in this investigation, we, we may actually be able to make a difference here. But it's a tricky thing because you also, there's no guarantees. And, um, you know, it, it, if anything happens, the New York Times can't go in and save your job. It can't even protect you in court if you end up getting sued. That's a, a huge, that's a huge distinction and separation that happens. So... Uh, we try to be as as honest as we can, um, and we also try to bring to the table some of the track records from the stories that we've worked on in the in the past, and say, listen, I can't promise what's going to happen in this situation, but here's the track record of stories we've done. Um, hello, um, I'm wondering what your standing relationship is with some of the women that you have used as sources, and like, if you know in the kind of wake of the story breaking, if they had reached out to you at all or like had cold feet about it coming out or anything like that? Oh, sure. I mean, we, we've we now had, you know, five-year dialogues with some of the women from the Weinstein story. You know, maybe this is a good opportunity to say something important, which is about the nature of this relationship. It's not a friendship. You're not a therapist. It's a journalist source relationship. So it can be a caring, compassionate relationship. Sometimes, especially like early on, it's also a very probing one. But there are real rules to the game and there are real boundaries. And it, I think we're almost at a very interesting stage in our relationship with some of these women because you know how it started, right? And and you know what eventually happened with the story, but now we're almost facing the more interesting question of, you know, what happens over time? Do you keep in touch? What kind of bond do you have? Um, none of us ever expected, you know, to end up on screen together. So sometimes, you know, we're going, like in some sense, we're going through this movie experience together with a few of them. But also, you know, the story is ongoing. I mean, Harvey Weinstein is still on trial, you know, in, in Los Angeles. And a lot of, um, he's a convicted rapist, and yet some of these allegations are still allegations that are, you know, perhaps very, very strong, but he hasn't 
admitted to them, right? And he hasn't been convicted on these particular allegations, which is like, those are the only two times in journalism you can say, yeah, the guy definitely did um, did that thing. Um, so anyway, so we we try to be we try to be we try to be mindful of the complexities of the relationship, and also the fact that everybody's lives were changed by this particular story. The the last chapter of the book she said is called The Gathering and we had the opportunity to get together with some with some of the women we reported on vis-a-vis -vis Weinstein, but also like one of the women who came forward to Megan about Trump um, and Christine Blasey Ford. And it was a discussion about what it's like to go public and on the record with these allegations and kind of what awaits you on the other side. Because our feeling was that these women had, they had valuable data, which everybody else needed. You know, they had struggled with the decision, they had committed to going public, and we wanted to know, okay, you know, how does it feel afterwards? Yeah, do you mind if I ask a question? Um, the book talks a lot about sort of the final moments, dotting all the I's, crossing the T's, but one thing that's big at the times for investigations is sort of the rollout, social, podcast, TV hits, <laughs> et cetera. How intimately involved in all of that are you? Because sort of, the story eventually gets away from you, but it's still sort of times platforms. And how much are you thinking about it in the reporting? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, you know, we th uh, we were thinking about those things five years ago. We think about them even more now. I mean, the we did an episode for the Daily um, based off of our Weinstein reporting, um, but that was something that was recorded after the story broke. There's also an element of sometimes investigations are so secret that nobody else in the newsroom knows what's your what you're working on you're sitting you you're you know surrounded by other investigative reporters who don't know exactly what you've got and when you're going to publish and that was uh, for us as you know from uh, the book and <clears throat> sort of the broader public telling of the story is that we ended up in fierce competition with Ronan Farrow uh, we had initially been aware that he was looking around in this same area and was reporting, kind of, we were doing cross-reporting, uh, if you will, at, we th at NBC, when he was at NBC, and then there was a moment where we thought, okay, it, we had heard that he was no longer working on that for NBC, and then all of a sudden, he was working on, the New, the, the New Yorker was doing fact-checking for a story, which meant that he had done a story, it delivered a story to the New Yorker that was coming very soon, so at that point, any of our plans on like launching um, completely changed because, you know, at that point we had Jody and I in our reporting had accumulated like this much information, and but when we sat down to and and I think our hope was that we would ultimately be able to publish like as much of it as we could include as much of it in the actually published story. But once we knew we were in competition to break the story first, it really like smushed that down so that we were going with like a, a fraction of what we had learned because that was the fraction we were able to get on the record and we had firm documentation of at that moment in time. And so there are certain stories that we've worked on where you don't necessarily have that competitive pressure that completely shortens your timeline and forces you to basically <laughs> get something out the door within a much shorter time frame. But you know, we are thinking about those things. We do think about as, as best as we can and when we're able, when things are not totally secretive, you still are contemplating what is, what are you gonna say on social media? And is there gonna be an opportunity to tell this story in audio? Sometimes we are actually working with the daily producers, not just after the story comes out, but as we, as we go, as we work on the story, um, with the idea that they can come out at the exact same time and pack, I think, a really powerful punch because there's no doubt that all these different, the, 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 the power of the printed word remains and is, you know, we're huge, I mean, we're, we're hugely devoted to 
you know, what goes up in the print paper and online. But it's so incredible what kind of storytelling you can do now. Um, we are having conversations with our with like graphics editors and visual editors and photo editors um, in the very beginning of our investigations because we recognize that you know what you can deliver now is so much more than you once were able to, and that we just need to embrace that um, and engage our readers and our listeners at all different levels. Next, there's a question over here, and then here. I feel like I should do a Michael Barbro. Mm. <laughs> um, so I'm not a um, journalism major. I'm actually a chemistry major. Uh, and this question is more about, I guess, the nature of journalism in general. Uh, you were talking about how you, as a journalist, you know, you're not an activist. You're not. You're not the person to whom we go to with the solutions. You're just bringing up the truth. But I think recently, um, especially through you know the Trump era. There are so many of these just absolutely crazy stories going on, you know, every single day. And you're going, at the beginning, you're going, I can't believe this happened. But at some point, it's it's just, it's all so insane. Even the most insane stories start sounding like, oh, yeah, I mean, of course he did that. Of course that happened. Um, so I'm wondering now in this era, um, do does the job of a journalist change? Does the journalist also now have a duty to not just bring up their story, but also make sure that that truth really does have an impact and is heard in this climate of crazy stories happening literally every single day. I mean, for someone who doesn't have a journalism background, I think you're asking a very good question. Look, there's like the obvious answer and then there's the more honest answer. The more obvious answer is like, have faith in facts, have faith in the power of stories. People care, be inventive in how you tell the story. Make sure you're not falling into like the ruts of cynicism. Use tools like the daily or, you know, visual flourishes or design to help your story, you know, break through in like a crowded field of, you know, um, depressing and disastrous news coverage. So I think. I think like that's certainly the right answer and those are the things that Megan and I do every day. I think there's also a second deeper answer very appropriate for a school like this one which is essentially the rhythms of investigative journalism for a long time go like this. Journalists carefully reports on problem, uncovers something really terrible and is able to publish. When said journalist publishes, some grown-up in charge, the mayor, a senator, the CEO of a corporation says, wow, this is really bad. I'm embarrassed, I'm outraged, or whatever, I'm gonna do something about it, and then something changes. And perhaps if you're really lucky like us, you win an award for you know the, the story that uncovered whatever thing. I think the tough question we have to ask now is whether that model, the model is, is durable, the model is reliable. I think the question is, can we play with the model a little bit? And here's why. Because part, like that formula depends on things that are in short supply. It depends on the audience being outraged by what they read. And as we know, there's there's this kind of numbness now, like the, the sort of cynicism that you're describing, we've all felt it. And also, as you may have noticed, in some arenas, there's kind of a lack of grown-ups in charge who are gonna, you know, who who are gonna change, you know, the really terrible thing, and who are gonna be bold and and act and be effective. Um, and so, I think, I think like the hardest question I struggle with conceptually, the thing that, like, being honest. I don't think I have the complete answer to, but I'm working towards is, are there ways we can re-engineer that model a little bit 
to create more runway and possibility of investigative impact. Good evening. Um, my question was, do you have any regrets on how you reported the story? I was just asked that, and I was asked in front of David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, and like our competitor, and I am so proud to say that I dodged the question. <laughs> but, but now we can't dodge yours. Yeah, do we have regrets about how we have reported stories in the past? Do we feel like we've made mistakes? Yeah, yeah we do. But also, I mean, I think, wouldn't you say that an investigation doesn't have to be perfect to work? Like, in, like, look, if we knew everything about Weinstein, if we could go back and do that investigation again, of, like, of course we would do it differently because we know and we didn't know back then. So did, like, did we make every perfect phone call? Did we make every perfect decision? Absolutely not, but the investigation still worked. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. Um, but I, I do think that there have been moments to go back to, I mean, we keep coming back to the reporter source relationship and caretaking, uh, caretaking of sources. And the, you know, Jody discussing the photographer, um, making sure that he was asking permission of every single photo he took for this, with this gr grieving family. You know, the nature of our work is such that we end up with people who have, un gone through oftentimes a lot of pain and injustice. And I think that over the years I have gotten, I mean, I've always taken that responsibility very seriously. Are there times where I look back and I talked somebody into going on the record? Not even, not even necessarily in, not even in some, not, not even necessarily, not in the Weinstein story, um, but in previous stories where I brought onto the record people who had experienced a lot of pain and suffering. And I made the case that it was gonna hopefully help make a difference. And it actually did. But I think that, you know, we are also encountering when you've got these different source reporter relationships, you're dealing with sources who are operating at, you know, varying levels of sophistication and there's obviously a, a difference in the way you're going to handle extremely sophisticated sources who are familiar with the way the media works and they know how the game is played. And then there's also, you know, and especially when they're not victims, when there may even be perpetrators of wrongdoing, you know, you are operating at a very different level and, and you're not necessarily going to be you're thinking about their feelings too, but you know, you're know you not carrying the same weight that you are when you're handling and when you're dealing with a source who's have been a victim of something and is not, you know, may not be, maybe from a background where they're not extremely educated. They're not, they don't, I mean, you're explaining the process to them as best you can, but they don't, you know, they may not fully grasp what they're participating in. And there's just, there's young, there's one young woman who I helped, I brought on to the record for this investigation I did of this black market and adopted children, people who had adopted children from foreign countries and decided they didn't want them anymore. And they went into these online chat groups and posted, posted ads for these kids saying, you know, anybody want a 12 year old Russian girl? Like, um, and they, these kids would be passed off to strangers, sometimes at truck stops. And I went out and I like hunted down those, some of the young people who had been passed along in this terrible underground network. And I got some of them to go on the record and they, some of them had just terrible experiences. I mean, level, they, they had been abandoned in their fam, they had been abandoned in their home countries. Then they had been brought here with the promise of better life and had been abandoned again and some bad things happened along the way. And there's one young woman that I brought onto the record in one of those stories and you know, she lives in the middle of nowhere, Michigan, and um, I don't think that made her life better. I don't think. I think it helped bring the, 
I think it brought helped expose this terrible black market and there have been laws that have been changed and people who went to prison because of what I wrote. But I still think about that young woman in Michigan, um, you know, not every day, but um, she's remained on my mind. And I just sometimes think that maybe in that particular case, it was not worth it to make that case and bring her onto the record that maybe I left her with more pain um, uh, for the benefit of the story. So I, I think that we've gotten more sophisticated in, in, in how we, at least for me, I take these, I, with every passing year, we've been in this business for 20 years. I, you know, I, I'm now at the point where I, you know, I read when somebody appears in a story, they know exactly what's word for word, what's going to be said about them to make sure that they feel 100% certain about participating and going on the record. And also that there's no surprises. I mean, something that makes me sleep better at night as a reporter is to know it's not just that, you know, I don't want to go to bed wondering what people are going to think of the story when it comes out. I kind of want to have a sense of how everyone's going to feel before before it's published. We have time for one last question. What's down in front here? Hi, thank you for all you've said so far tonight. I'm a double major in journalism as well as gender studies and one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is what happens when a story becomes canonized into history um, and that the way we tell our histories is often influenced by and um, is a way to reinforce dominant narratives today and especially with stories that involve some pushback against some dominant social structures that exist. I mean, we've seen with so many examples from the 20th century and into today how we tell histories in ways that still reinforce the status quo today. Um, and one thing I was really struck by and she said was, you're writing about um, Dr. Ford, I thought was really powerful and I was so in awe of the way that you unpacked how it wasn't necessarily a single action or decision by any one person, but there was a collection of forces that came to culminate in her testimony. And there was so much nuance and so much light brought into that chapter that I feel like is really lacking in a lot of ways we tell the histories of really important moments like this. So my question for you is, as not only your Harvey Weinstein story, but she said in the story of how you told this story and how it ignited the Me Too movement, as this becomes part of journalism history and part of our global history and as it's talked about, what are your hopes, but perhaps also your fears for what might happen as it becomes a history? Well, first of all, you know just what to say to two authors. <laughs> if you ever meet anybody who's written a book, find the part of the book that they love, but that got less attention and tell them like describe it in the terms that you just described with such perfect understanding of what we were trying to do. Can we can come up here, can we give you a hug? Yeah, those <laughs> authors are gonna love you forever. So you, you have the, you're gonna go far in publishing if that's what you, if that's what you choose to do. Um, listen, it's a great question and look, it's an especially great question with this movie coming out because the, the cinema of it is so powerful and there's so much that's totally authentic about it, but it's not the same kind of reliable, you know, historical record in, in the book. We spent time and frankly money doing like every little citation at the end of the book for the reason you mentioned, because we want people you know, God willing, a hundred years from now to say, oh, this came from this interview, you know, this came from, you know, they got, they got this piece of information um, for this thing. You know, I think we would be, we can't control everything about how this is remembered in the future, right? We could spend the rest of our lives trying and probably not succeed. I think it's our goal to tell it as straight as possible, to let the women, the sources, speak for themselves, to leave really good records of what happened so that even though we're, we may be the primary narrators, but you know we're not the sole narrators of what happened, and then hope that the right themes come to the fore. You know, the one we're talking about more and more now that time passes 
is the ability of a very small group of sources to make a difference. If you look at the number of people who really helped us in the course of the Weinstein investigation, relative to the impact they had, it's extraordinary. Like Laura Madden, this divorced mom with breast cancer in Wales, she was like, she was like dusting off this story from her past, right? On the one hand, it shaped her entire life, but on the other hand, she was like, you know, a bunch of the sources were like, why are we revisiting this ancient thing that I've buried? Well, this ancient thing that each of them buried turned out to help spur a global uprising. So, you know, we're not gonna be in charge forever, but we hope that one of the permanent takeaways is the power of airing these stories and the power of facts to, it, to affect change. I, no, I mean, that, I just wanna bottle that <laughs> and uh, bring it back with us to the newsroom. That was really, yeah, thank you for such a thoughtful perspective. Thank you to both of you for giving us your time, your book, your movie. <laughs> Thanks to Hello. Just wanna, oh great. So I just wanna, um, again, obviously this has just been inspiring and incredible as um, hope for, for years now and so to have you here. Thank you again to Jody, Megan, and to Patty. We have um, a few moments, we have a reception outside with some light Nosh, because this is Hillel, and, um, and we invite you to come to that and have a chance to talk a little bit with Jody and Megan. Thank you all again for coming, and thank you for being here. Take care. There's the QR code, folks. Get your tickets for the showing of the movie next Wednesday. <laughs>